Hi, I'm Carl Azus, kicking off your Thursday edition of CNN Student News. First up, a historic showdown between the U.S. Congress and the U.S. President. Earlier this month, the House and Senate passed a controversial bill. Its goal was to allow the families of terrorism victims to sue the government of Saudi Arabia. Why? The Middle Eastern country has been accused of helping the terrorist group that conducted the September 11, 2001 attacks. Fifteen of the terrorists were from Saudi Arabia. The Saudi government has denied having any role in the attacks. Why did President Obama oppose the bill? He said it would interfere with his ability to conduct foreign policy and that it could potentially lead to the U.S. government being sued in other countries' court systems. For its part, Saudi Arabia threatened to abandon hundreds of billions of dollars of investments in American assets if the bill passed. Why did U.S. lawmakers support the bill? They felt the families of 9-11 victims deserved to have their day in court against Saudi Arabia. One attorney in the suit suggested that if the Saudi government was innocent, it wouldn't have to be afraid of the lawsuits. So what happened with the bill? President Obama vetoed it last week, but yesterday afternoon, Congress overrode that veto. It was the first time that's happened since President Obama took office. Overriding a veto takes a two-thirds vote in both the Senate and the House, and it's pretty rare. Only around 4% of U.S. presidential vetoes have ever been overridden, according to the Wall Street Journal. U.S. government is planning to send roughly 500 additional American troops to the Middle Eastern nation of Iraq. Right now, there are around 5,000 U.S. troops serving there. That includes those in Iraq on temporary status. The number has been increasing since 2014. Iraq's government requested more U.S. forces to help out with the upcoming battle for Mosul, a city in northern Iraq that's controlled by the ISIS terrorist group. U.S. officials have indicated that the Americans might be closer to combat, though not at the front lines. That's significant because in 2014, President Obama said American combat troops would not be battling on foreign soil in the fight against ISIS. U.S. officials expect this will be the last increase of American military troops in Iraq, but the nation will likely remain a challenge for America. The next U.S. president will be caught between Iraq and a hard place. Barack Obama pulled U.S. troops out in his first term, but now they're back. They're there to help crush ISIS, which was born in Iraq. But the war against the terror group has obscured one important fact. Iraq is never far from falling apart. There are three main groups in the country. The Kurds, who basically control much of the north. The Shia, who rule from Baghdad and are influenced by Iran and the once dominant Sunni Arab minority who don't trust the Kurds or the Shia. In the post-ISIS future, the next American president will have the unenviable task of trying to keep Iraq together while at the same time preventing a return of ISIS in a different reincarnation. It's not mission possible, but it's close to it. To the Midwestern U.S. state of Iowa, the National Weather Service has extended flood warnings to Sunday in the city of Cedar Rapids. Thousands had to evacuate after more than 10 inches of rain fell in eastern Iowa and western Wisconsin last week. Over the weekend, city workers, contractors, volunteers, and National Guard troops banded together. They built temporary walls, levees, and laid down 250,000 sandbags, and it looks like it all worked. The city manager says the efforts appeared to protect the city of Cedar Rapids from serious flooding. The major concern was the Cedar River and how high it would rise. It crested at just over 22 feet, and that is six feet above what's considered major flood stage. So what's the difference between river flooding and flash flooding? 
You can see these different categories. So up here in the purple, that's major flood stage. And then of course, in this orange, that is minor flood stage. So you take the first one. This is a flash flood event. And you can see how steep this spike is. It's basically flat. And then in a matter of hours, boom, peaks. And then it drops off rather quickly as well. Another instance, you may have two thunderstorms, so you have a small peak and then you have a big peak. But the point is it happens extremely quickly. The difference in river flooding is it is a very gradual process. The river will rise, sometimes taking days and then gradually falling. That's a river flood. Here's another example, even more dramatic. And you can see the slow rise and then the slow fall. The head of SpaceX, a space exploration company, is laying out a plan for humans to colonize Mars, the planet. And Elon Musk says this could happen in 50 to 150 years, though he wants to get it started, sending the first humans to Mars in the year 2024. I think there are two main motivations for, for Mars. I mean, one is, is the sort of defensive reason of saying, okay, if, if something were to happen to, to Earth, do, is... is Life as we know it, does it end? Uh, or if it's on another planet, then it probably doesn't end. A multi-planet civilization is likely to last a lot longer than a single planet civilization. The other part of it is it would just be an incredible adventure. Yeah. It would be very exciting. Um, and even if somebody never planned to go to Mars, just following the progress, I think, would vi vicariously would be um, quite inspiring. But at the moment, quite expensive. Musk says it cost about $10 billion to get someone there with today's technology. He wants to get the price of a ticket down to $200,000 per person through the development of newer and more advanced systems. He says ultimately the mission would need a combo of private and government funds. The downsides. Musk says that people wanting to go to Mars would have to be prepared to die, that the fatality risk would be high. Also, SpaceX is currently dealing with setbacks like the explosion of one of its rockets on a launch pad earlier this month. But the company, like the U.S. government, is working to send people far beyond the moon. If technologically it becomes possible to colonize other worlds, do you think our bodies and our brains could handle it? Definitely our brains could handle it. Probably the biggest uh, impediment to just going there is the cost. I mean, I think we can overcome the, the challenges if we could overcome the financial requirements. Who knows what the resources are on Mars, but I think there are advantages, assuming you could do it, to having a, uh, another livable planet. NASA believes in redundant systems and Earth is a system, so if at some point in our future it became feasible to maybe make Mars somewhat like Earth, then it would be, uh, there would be a lot of value to that. But there's also value in just exploring for exploration's sake. I mean, we're explorers. And I think doing stuff that is really, uh, really complicated, really difficult, that challenges us, also adds, uh, you know, to our, to our economy and, you know, makes uh, our lives better right here on Earth. Do you think that Elon Musk setting up his own Mars architecture, that that compromises the government's ambitions in any way, shape, or form? Not at all. And, uh, you know, I would hope that NASA would uh, even partner with him in some respects. Uh, you know, having competition in everything always helps, too. If we looked at it like, you know, if someone's trying to get there first, that would be helpful, too. Would you go to Mars? Yes. You would go to Mars? Yes. For but how I, long, though? Um, I, I would go on the three-year trip where you come home. Were you ever counting down the days when you were spending that year in space? I um, tried to count up. Unfortunately, my colleague Misha started counting down at day 100. Every day he would say 99, 98, 97. So I had to count down because of him. Before we go, a British prince totally disrespecting a Canadian prime minister. A few well-known members of Britain's royal family are spending the week in Canada. They arrived Saturday. Three-year-old Prince George was among them. But when Canada's leader knelt down to offer a high five, little prince just shook his head. No high five. No low five. Not even a handshake. Nothing. Guess the young royal just thought he'd keep his hands to himself. Does he deserve a hand? Does he need a hand learning etiquette? You could call it a royal snub or a princely put down or say the whole situation got out of hand. But in this case, it seems it's the Briton who's declaring independence. 
I'm Carl Azus for CNN Student News.